everybody knows is that over the same period and almost at the same rate at which we got performance improvement, there was an efficiency decline. And you know what? What do I mean here by efficiency? Well, it, it is a, a, a simple, perhaps simplistic met metric, where if I give you twice as many transistors, you might expect to get twice as much performance out of your system. Or if I give you the transistors at twice their operating frequency, you might expect twice as much performance. And uh, the next slide here, you know, gives an example on uh, <coughs> very early uh, integrated microprocessors in 1971. Uh, going up to a Pentium, and, and you know, there's a lot, certainly not trying to pick on Intel here. This is true for IBM uh, processors, uh, exactly the same. Of course, we, had a, uh, we didn't start quite as early. Uh, but what you see here is that on, on that metric of uh, uh, here, I, I equate the number of instructions issued with the performance now, you know, it's only approximately true. But you, you see that there's a, you know, a, a three orders of magnitude roughly decline over, uh, over this period uh, in, uh, in that metric of efficiency. So, you know, keep this in mind. Um, and it doesn't mean that, that we were not doing the right thing uh, during this period. Uh, programmability is, is incredibly important, uh, and uh, it, it was, uh, you know, clearly a very successful path. Uh, but this decline in efficiency is perhaps one, one indication, uh, you know, that, that there are other paths that could have been followed. <coughs> On this analysis, uh the number of transistors, the overall number of transistors, including all the memory. Right? Yeah, that's right. So you know you have to, and, and especially if you if you dive into the into the power numbers a little bit and you try to compare to what you expected from scaling, you know you, you come to the realization that you probably need to do this right. You have to distinguish between logic transistors and IOs and because they don't scale the same way, etc. So this is a, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is an order of magnitude thing. You know. It's a, no more than that. Um, so, so of course, what uh, what what happened to us uh, that, uh, that that drove us away from uh, from this path of a single per, per thread performance gain um, is, is is it's actually a combination of things. But perhaps one of the most important ones was that uh, around the transition to to 45 nanometer, um, you know, we, we got to a point where if we would have continued to, uh, to scale our, our, our oxides the way we, we used to, uh, we would have ended up with designs um, uh, where, the, where the leakage power significantly uh, exceeded the, uh, the, 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 uh, the switching power. And there's actually another curve here that comes, uh, I, think, I don't think it shows up here for some reason, but um, about the, 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 uh, you know, the, the gate oxide tunneling curve that also came on very strong same point there. You know, as a, as a result, we've been uh, stuck with, with the, uh, the oxide thicknesses at, at roughly where they were in, in, uh, in, in 45. Um, we've, of course, compensated uh, by, uh, by introducing uh, high-K material that gives us a, 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 a step forward. Uh, but, but fundamentally, it, it, it was the end of, uh, you know, of scaling, at least in, in, uh, in that dimension. Uh, this is uh, you know, one of the reasons that we can't really lower the voltages uh, the way we need to. Not being able to lower the voltages, you know, our power densities don't go down the way we need to. And because the power density doesn't go down, you know, our frequencies can't go up. Because our frequencies can't go up, you know, the performance doesn't really scale. And we had to find uh, another way to, uh, uh, to, to get efficiency. So, you know, the, the, the f even though Around this time, we were playing with cell, and I'll certainly talk about cell in a little bit. You know, the, the industry response to this, of course, was, was multi-core, you know, not, not heterogeneous multi-core. Um, and, um, you know, obviously, given what I told you before, uh, if I give you twice as many transistors, uh, yes, you can try to use them to make a faster single core, but a more efficient way to use them is to build two cores your uh, problems are, uh, are parallel. Now, now the, 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 the usual thing that people are concerned about there is, is, is Andal's law, uh, you know, which given a certain uh, sequential component of a problem, uh, you know, it, it, uh, that, that component begins to dominate when you parallelize the problem. Now, fortunately, uh, there's an observation, and I think uh, Gustafsson has written it down, that 
on, 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 on bigger systems, we tend to solve larger problems. And fortunately, the sequential component of a larger problem tends to be smaller. So that's, that's kind of how, how, we, how we do get away with the with parallel processing in most cases. So, so we've, we've gone this multi-core route. Uh, this, this is a, you know, an IBM example. We actually started it uh, pretty early in IBM. We introduced a dual-core processor in, in 2001. You know, uh, not not necessarily because we we're, we're smarter than everybody else or anything like that. It's you know, if you build server processors, I think you run into this problem a little bit sooner than uh, say if you're building processors for PCs. Uh, and you know, if if you and, and, and clearly this is this is going very fast. I mean, we're up to eight cores, but we're actually up to uh, 32 threads already. I think it's it's power seven. Uh, and uh, um, you know, building. Building, uh, uh, you know, very uh, powerful ships. The, the, the Power Seven, as, as you as you know, um, has, uh, has has eight cores. It, it, the, the specific thing about it that, that is a little bit different, you know, other than that, it clearly is a, a server processor, and you can see that from from how the I/O is integrated. Uh, is uh, is embedded DRAM, which actually allows us to have, you know. Uh, 32 meg of, of L2 and, and deal with the bandwidth consequences of having so many cores. Uh, it's not really the topic of this talk, but one of the key challenges if you use your transistors to build more cores is that the, the usual scaling of, of memory bandwidth that, that you had with single thread processors where you know, if you double the size of the processor and then also double the size of the cache, you, know, you sort of get an automatic uh, reduction of the, uh, you know, of, of the off chip. Uh, so, so if, 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 your, if your core grows 40% square root of 2 in performance for twice as many transistors, which is sort of roughly what we were all, and if your cache gets twice as big and, and as a rule of thumb captures square root of 2 times as many um, loads in that cache, then your off chip bandwidth needs, needs to go up only roughly with the frequency of the cores in, in the cache. Now, with multi core, if you double the number of cores, you know, unless you have very uh, beneficial cache sharing effects, your off-chip bandwidth goes up. So, you know, hence it's that's a thing we have to work on. And we worked on it with, with EDRM. Yeah. Um, you know, very uh, yeah. because cell was used for a supercomputer. This is what you know what we've done in terms of integration with uh, Power Seven uh, for for supercomputers. This this is a. <laughs> If you ever get a chance to see this thing, <laughs> and, and those of you that, that have visited supercomputers and probably have seen it, it's, this is this is just a this is a marvel of engineering. It's, it's a, um, you know it's 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 a circuit board, you know about this big, about about that thick, so many so big that you couldn't build it in one piece. You know it's clamped together in the middle. The whole thing is water cooled. Uh, this contains eight modules with four of those processors at about. You know, 200-ish watts each. So each of these puppies here is about a, a thousand watts, mm -hmm. and it's, it's doing about uh, uh, you know a teraflop of, uh, of, of of double precision float in each of these models. So, so you have a you know very very nice So you, you know the the, the multi-core um, um, evolution is 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 clearly uh, working for us and giving us systems of uh, of very high performance. Um, you know, I mentioned memory before. One, one thing that's just a piece of trivia about that particular machine is that even the memory is, is cool. And uh, you know, if, if you follow, again, if you follow supercomputing a little bit, and you read uh, about some of the things, concerns about building, you know, an exascale machine, a, a, a machine a thousand times bigger than what we built itself, um, memory and the amount of power, uh, as well as money that you can spend on memory, is, is one of the, the big concerns. It's kind of reflected here a little bit in, in that uh, you, know, you see that, that memory is, is, uh, is one of the Okay, now back to, uh, oh, there's a picture of it. Um, so, so, so look for a second at, uh, you know, why, why are these uh, uh, chip multiprocessors with shared memory uh, dominant? You know, there's actually a single architecture that, that is dominating across uh, all the major vendors for um, server and, uh, and, and PC type of systems, uh, and and that that has a lot to do with uh, with the programming model. You know, just like that was the motivation for us 
uh, to grow uh, performance at the expense of efficiency. Uh, similarly, here with multi-core, it's really the, the programming model and, and uh, you know, the benefits that you get from these systems if you, if you don't change the programming model uh, that, that forces us in, into these kinds mm -hmm. of designs. So in, you know, obviously in a, in a shared memory multi-core machine, uh, even if you don't use all of the cores, well, at least you get the benefit uh, in your application of the larger memory. Uh, your other resources like I.O. are available uh, to the application, you know, whether you use all the, all the cores or not. Um, and, uh, you know, an, another aspect that, that, that perhaps is worth talking about a little bit is, um, you know, I pointed out that there was, you know, roughly three orders of magnitude uh, loss of uh, efficiency. So you might ask, okay, you know, if you're going to make this transition to multi-core, uh, you know, but why not do it much more uh, in a much more extreme way? Uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, you, you could have built, you know, when you decided to build uh, uh, 32 cores, you, you know, you could have decided to, to build 256 of them, or maybe even a thousand. You, you do have enough transistors. You know, if you look at how many transistors per core we needed in the past, then your aggregate performance uh, certainly would be would be higher. Uh, well, the reason is that. You know, again, uh, is, is basically application and software inertia, right? If 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 I uh, if I go to somebody and try to sell them a machine uh, with a larger number of cores, even if the performance of one core is not improved very much, at least it's not lower. So your old applications uh, do not run slower on the new machine. If I go to lots of very small cores, uh, you know, you, you actually your old applications will run distinctly worse, until you put in a lot of effort uh, to parallelize them. So that's why we better move forward with this. Now, now looking forward, and you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize this, because you know, this is looking at the, uh, this is basically looking at the frequency uh, of, of uh, microprocessors under constant power density <coughs> assumptions. So let's say that uh, you know, it's not economical to um, uh, get a, a density in, in terms of watt per square millimeter that is, that is much higher than, than what we have today. Um, you know that that will limit the, uh, the the frequency that we can achieve in the future. Now there's a there's a few caveats here. You know, of course, there's uh, assumptions here about you know the about the, the types of transistors. Um, the, the other thing that I should point out is that unlike this this chart that looked at leakage currents. Uh, versus switching currents, uh, which had a log scale, you know, this is a this is actually a linear scale. So it, it's not as it, it's not as, as gruesome as, as maybe you think at first. But still, nonetheless, you know, what this chart appears to tell us is that uh, after 32 nanometer, if I take a core, uh, as as we've done a few times with the the cell microprocessor and migrate it to a new technology, uh, you know. It, it, it may be the case that if you don't change your design and you, and you try to shrink everything, your core will actually slow down. This chart focuses on transistors. I think the situations with situation with wires is not any better and perhaps significantly worse. The connectivity. The connectivity. Yes. Yeah. So, so this is only this is pretending that the frequency is fully determined by transistors. Of course, you know you have transistor dominated path and you have wire dominated path, and uh, the way wires will scale. Um, you know, we're, we're actually beginning to get to, to, to dimensions on the on the wires where you know the, the mean free path of the electrons is <laughs> you know beginning to see the edges of, of, of the wires and, and you know I, I I don't know exactly what that means. There, there's probably a chart behind that somewhere that I think could look worse than this one. But but anyway, there's there's a, there's some reason to believe that you know that, that, that technology could could well force us uh, to make. Uh, make yet another transition and look for more efficient ways to, uh, to, use our, uh, to use our resources. So, you know, what, what, will, we, what we will, be, will we do when we uh, get more transistors, but in the extreme case, we don't get more active transistors. So, so pretend, and this will take a while, that we get more transistors, but the energy to switch a transistor doesn't go down anymore. 